Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett at CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Share your personal info for greater privacy. We've got that story plus dog poop DNA. But first, an update on a story that really was heard all around the world. However, you might not have heard the update. Chinese baby gene editing scientist goes missing. The whereabouts of Chinese scientist He Jian Kui, who claims to have created the world's first gene edited babies, his whereabouts remain unknown amid rumors that he has been arrested. Reports claim he was placed under effective house arrest in Shenzhen after making an appearance at the Second International Summit on Human Genome Editing in Hong Kong, which happened on November 28th. Folks might recall when the story was first kind of breaking, they were saying, oh, well, we'll find out more when he speaks at this conference. And those are the last words anybody knows from him. However, claims of he's detention dismissed by his former employee, Southern University of Science and Technology, but they declined to elaborate any further. The scientist sparked global controversy when he announced via a YouTube video that he had successfully used a gene editing tool to modify the DNA of two embryos. James, this is the brave new world here and now. It certainly is. Now, this is a fascinating story from all sorts of different perspectives, one of which is just the pure scientific perspective of what's happening here and uh, the incredible breach of standards and protocols and what have you that uh, went on here with regards to this trial and how he went about getting consent from the parents and informed consent in, I think he said, two different conversations over three hours or something, getting consent for this this trial and then uh, the way he informed them about what happened with the embryos that he edited and all of that. It, it, there's a lot of craziness and shenanigans involved in that. But of course, the, f the more fundamental scientific question relates back to something we've talked about earlier, which is CRISPR, of course. CRISPR not being the laser, precise, perfect way to edit genes that was originally sold to the public. Oh, there's kind of random mutations that kind of creep in. And, you know, what does that mean when you're not just randomly mutating something that's going to be in a Petri dish and then get discarded, but something that's going to grow into a a fully-fledged adult being and reproduce itself. And then those mutations get passed on. And who knows what Pandora's box that kind of thing opens, plus the added benefit of mosaicism, where some of the edited genes, some of them genes get turned off, some of them don't, and uh, in some cells, in other cells, they, they don't. So uh, those coexist, and then that creates some sort of hybrid. I mean, again, there are, there's so many different scientific issues as to what's going on here, which is one of the reasons the scientific community is in an uproar about this. But uh, again, more fundamentally than that even, this of course raises the, 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 the likelihood, in fact, the near certainty, if it's been done by this guy in this lab at this place, are we really to suspect it's never been done before or will never be again? Because don't worry, the WHO, latest update, the WHO is going to set step in and they're holding an emergency conference to create new guidelines and rules for what to do with gene editing and all of this. So they're going to create an international standard and code and blah, blah, blah. A, how are you going to enforce that? And B, what goes on behind closed doors and you know, DARPA or wherever else. I mean, do you really think the military isn't already looking wait for ways to militarize this uh, type of technology? Hey, we can we can edit the super soldier into existence. I mean, maybe that already exists. Again, there's so many different things that this... So in a way, this is actually a good story in that it at least opens this up so the public is aware of it. But unfortunately, it creates the problem reaction solution where the solution is going to be the WHO and this new international standards and guidelines. And don't worry, guys, we got it all under control. Yeah, maybe we'll edit some uh, embryos in Petri dishes for experiments, but don't worry, no, no one will come to fruition. It'll, it'll all, you know, it'll all wash out. But that is essentially going to be, yeah, we'll contain this technology for the masses, but, you know, what's going on behind closed doors with the intelligence agencies and whatever? I mean, who knows, right? So it's a, it's a hell of a story, and the, I suppose it's fitting, in a way, that the scientists behind all of this just got disappeared, pre presumably never to be seen again. We'll, we'll find out. Which, you know, which seems in some ways like a classic move for, of course, the most favored nation, the model nation of China. You get disappeared and sometimes you get your organs removed i think i made reference a couple months ago james as it i believe turned turned legal turned 18 
Radiohead's album from 2000, Kid A, was talking about the first genetically engineered human. And they were sort of speculating about it again with the idea that how do we know this hasn't already been done? And again, thinking about that 18 years ago. I think one of the other interesting parts about this and some of the work that he was doing, the editing, was surrounding HIV and AIDS, which, again, isn't something you hear on the top of all the scientific research anymore. So, again, just a lot of interesting points. And I will include on this first segment a related story, James, that takes us from China to Japan. Japan allows gene editing for research only. Genetic editing in fertilized human eggs can be conducted for basic research purposes, but births will be forbidden, the Japanese government said in draft guidelines issued just this past week, hoping to avoid a repeat of last month's outcry after a Chinese scientist claimed to have produced genetically altered children. So we move from our first to our second segment on this New World Next Week, episode 359 for December 6, 2018. Scientists say National DNA Registry will lead to greater privacy and other news, you know, ignorance of strength and for, you know, freedom of slavery and all those things. A group of medical researchers have a counterintuitive proposal for shielding people's most intimate personal data from prying eyes. Share more of it, they say. A lot more of it. In a new paper published in the journal Science, researchers suggest that the best way to protect genetic information might be for all Americans to deposit their data in a universal nationwide DNA database. The paper is being published by researchers from the Vanderbilt University Medical Center's Center for Genetic Privacy and Identity in Community Settings, a major center for the study of genetic privacy. Concerns about who can gain access to the genetic info gathered by consumer genetic testing websites has been on the climb since April when the cops made that big arrest in the decades-old serial killer case in California to ensnare the alleged Golden State Killer. Investigators trawled an open-source database popular with genealogy hobbyists to search for relatives of possible suspects. The cops found matches, and then they allegedly got their man. If enhancing privacy by creating a giant database of people's DNA sounds counterintuitive, the group's point is that it's already too late to prevent mass exposure. It's too late for you. Just give up all your information anyway. If you don't have anything to hide, well, why should you be so secretive, James? The PDF and the really interesting article and all the supplemental information is not paywalled, fortunately. Is it time for a universal genetic forensic database? That's the PDF we will include in the show notes, James. Yeah, I have an answer to that question, and the answer is not yes. Uh, yeah, the, this, I think, we're, we're sourcing this from uh, Technocracy News, of course, the website of uh, Patrick Wood, and he has a little editorial comment at the beginning of this article, which sources from Bloomberg, and he says, the suggestion is that a national database of everyone's DNA would be easier to regulate and hence would ultimately lead to greater privacy. Who would be the regulator? Ah, the government, of course. What could go wrong with that? And I think that's probably the uh, the exact right way to frame this discussion. Because, yes, if you think that centralized... Oh, we'll, we'll mandate it, and so everyone has to give up their genetic information. But don't worry, the government will take care of it in their nice little database. A... There's no possible way that there will ever be any misuse of this information. And uh, and B, n never be hacked. Don't worry. You've never heard about a, you know, a database being hacked or, or information being stolen. No. Why would that happen? I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous. And of course, one of the most fundamental invasions of privacy that's possible. Um, people might go back to uh, my recent uh, podcast episode about the ways that your privacy is being uh, violated or eroded or whatever the title of that was. <laughs> Don't worry, Brock, will put it up on screen for people <laughs> at this point. But uh, uh, yeah, DNA privacy is an exceptionally important part of this and something that I've talked about before, because guess what? If you were born in a hospital in the Western world, essentially, any time since the 1960s, your DNA is already in a national database. You just didn't know about it. I've talked about this before. I'll put a link into a uh, article I wrote several years back talking about the DNA database that already exists. When they do a little blood prick test on the baby's heel, they take those blood 
prints and they put them on cards and they store those cards away and technically those cards belong to the government and they can and do use them for scientific research purposes, although you never hear about it. You didn't give any informed consent as a newborn, but it's already being done. So this already exists, but now they're trying to formalize it and get you to give up your adult DNA as part of willingly putting yourself in this database. This is hor horrific. It's a horrible idea, and I hope people understand how much is at stake. Giving up your genetic information is the absolute most invasive thing that can happen, and they are trying to normalize it. And I think we have to give up before, or stop this before it becomes the Gattaca nightmare scenario. Well, and to even kind of speak to your, you know, your comments about, oh, surely nothing will ever get hacked this week. Just one of the most massive hack attacks we've seen. And again, just more on the cyber elements. And of course, that's how they'll store all of these genetic database items. The Marriott Hotel system. Half a billion people's information was stolen in the last week. And that's just from some hotel. So we will conclude this Gattaca horror-themed episode of your New World Next Week series. With the hat trick, the third and final story, tired of cleaning up dog poop, Minnesota apartment manager uses DNA tests to fine pet owners. We grab this from TucsonNewsNow.com, an apartment complex in Minnesota where 56 dogs live, has been identifying all dog feces left on the ground using DNA in order to determine which pet owners are to blame. Property manager Peggy Walsh says the average dog produces 276 pounds of poop every year. So she implemented a new policy. All dog poop left on the ground is sent to the Tennessee-based company Poo Prints, P-R-I-T-N-T-S, Poo Prints, like, you know, fingerprints, which allow apartment staff to send a portion of the feces away for DNA testing. You don't have to send all of it, I guess. Poo Prints sends the testing results in about seven to ten business days. When the results arrive, the apartment residents who own the offending dogs will be facing a fine 350 bucks for the first offense, 450 bucks for the second offense, and third prize is you're evicted. Walsh says the results should be at least 90% accurate. Apartment staff has already sent four poop samples in for testing. James, my main question of this, and maybe it's a dumb question, how do they connect the offending poop back to the dog in the apartment complex? I don't know. We don't know. We, th we were talking about this before we started rolling, and, uh, you know, who knows? There are different ways that they could do this, but I have one possible suggestion. Going back to uh, something that I wrote about three years ago for The Forecaster, I wrote an article on DNA shaming. Welcome to Orwell's Nightmare. And this is a story that relates back to a advertising campaign, a marketing campaign of sorts, that was put together by our good friends at Ogilvy Mather uh, in Hong Kong, where... As I wrote, uh, samples of litter were collected from the streets of Hong Kong, in including chewing gum, cigarette butts, and a condom. Then the samples were sent to a laboratory, and DNA of the glittery, guilty litter bugs were, uh, were extracted from the items of DNA fe uh, for DNA phenotyping. This process reads the tens of thousands of genetic variants from each sample and compiles an image from the predicted facial structure, eye, hair, and skin color, and even the freckling of the individual to whom the DNA belongs. The result, a creepy computer-assembled image of the face of whoever dropped the garbage in the first place. And then they take those computer-assembled uh, images and they put them on posters in that area and said, watch out, there's a litterer around here and this is what he may look like. So it was like wanted posters for littering, essentially. And it was a way to bring public attention to the issue of litter and, oh, you know, and whatever, in a cool and snazzy new way. But uh, essentially, that's, I mean similar to this poo print thing. I mean, they could construct, well, this is from this genetic material, this is from this DNA, this is what we would expect the dog to look like. So is there any dog that matches this? I don't know, that might be how they're doing it. But anyway, if you'd thought this was just about dogs and poo prints, nope, you know, it's already being used on humans. Uh, in a funny, you know, marketing, you know, campaign, ad awareness campaign kind of way. And again, the question is, if it's being used for these these overt purposes. What covert purposes is this type of technology already being used for? Not to raise the specter of Gattaca for the second time in our conversation today, but hey, it's a pretty Gattaca-themed episode here. 
Absolutely. I mean, I covered a story pretty recently where I think they're running a trial program in North Carolina where they're essentially testing all kinds of waste that runs through the sewers so they can track down those nasty drug dealers who dare to do the drugs that the government brings in for themselves, James. <laughs> so I like to remind everybody at the end of these episodes, I stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific Time at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. I've been playing all the latest audio, like your awesome interview with our friend Richard Grove of Tragedy and Hope, and of course, all three parts of the World War One conspiracy, the propaganda watches, all that good stuff been on the streams, James. I hope people will join you at the stream, and until next week, take care. We'll talk to you again. All right, buddy. Thanks. <laughs>